My name is Ashley Taylor. I'm Director of Education for Rice 360, and it's my joy to welcome you today for this exciting seminar. Um, I also want to thank our partners, uh, Bioengineering, especially Dr. Sabia Abadi, who we'll hear from in a moment, who have partnered um, really wonderfully to make this event possible. So thank you to them. We, we are so excited today to welcome Dr. Robert Reed and Nathaniel Bouchard, who have traveled to be with us to share their very exciting and inspiring work to develop an open source ventilator. Um, and I, I think what you'll hear today is about a team of inventors who Dr. Reed and Nathaniel represent, who have been working for, for over two years on developing an open source ventilator that can fundamentally increase health equity around the world. When asked about their motivation for undertaking this amazing initiative, um, they shared and took us back to November 2020 um, in a, a very challenging time for the global community. Nathaniel in particular shared that he and his colleagues um, were inspired and, and fiercely motivated, a lot of sleepless nights, um, to try to do something about the global shortage of ventilators. And I think this it will be a, a reminder for us all today about the power that we all have to be a part of solutions that can advance health equity. So I am excited. I know we're all excited to hear from Dr. Reed and from Nathaniel today. And I will turn over to Dr. Abadi to, to give us some remarks. So I know Rob for a couple of years now. I have, how many? Three years? I feel like I've known you for much longer. So if you don't know Rob, Rob is a very intense, passionate I would say very fiery. Like it, every time I talk to him, I'm like so inspired. But he has a very interesting background. He's a computer scientist by training, uh, a Rice alum. He went to UT, did his PhD. And um, so he's computer science, a, a world that I know nothing about, very little about anyway. But um, he started this group called Public Invention, which he'll talk a little bit more about. And one of the public invention initiatives or projects that they're undertaking is this Polyvent platform. Now, this platform and it's incredible to me. Nathaniel, you were the lead engineer, is that right? Uh, yeah, so I designed most of the parts and built all the stuff, and I helped build the Nathaniel is a freshman. Yeah, he's a freshman in college. So he's, he's a Canadian. We will forgive him on that. Um, <laughs> but uh, he is so, but, you know, very talented, brilliant young, young man here. And I think just as Dr. Taylor said, this is just very inspiring. This is a beautiful sort of piece of work. Um, right now, it's an educational platform, but you know, maybe one day in the open source sort of spirit, it can be something more. I, when I spoke to Dr. Reed um, and he said that he would be coming, I said, please talk about sort of the design history. So I think we as engineers, we as consumers, sometimes we just see the first product and we see the end product. And we don't know what happens in between in terms of the major design choices that you have to make all along the way that have costs, that have benefits. Um, and you have to really sort of keep in mind what is that final objective? Who are you trying to target? And so I've asked Rob and Nathaniel to really focus on that. Um, so this is going to be a, a very sort of fun talk for you design folks, uh, engineering folks. It's going to be a little bit of physiology, so sorry for that, or <laughs> you're welcome for that. Um, but I'm just going to turn it over to them. I, I would say please use this opportunity to understand their motivation, how they sort of made their decisions. There's a little piece of sort of mechanical engineering, bioengineering, some computer science, some electrical engineering, something in it for everybody. But please just help me welcome Rob and Nathaniel. Um, so can I just have a show of hands? Who is an undergraduate here? Thank you. Uh, who's interested particularly in mechanical engineering? Thank you. Electrical engineering? Uh, physiology? Okay, so all, all spread out. So what we're going to do is, as, as we said, we use Dr. Abadi's guidance to design this. So we're going to kind of be showing you a lot of mistakes that we made and where we stepped in a bucket and things, things like that. Um, in the middle of the talk, we're going to show a, a live demo and we're going to invite people to come up here and see the equipment. But um, please, you can interrupt us with questions. We've got a lot of slides, but I can go through them very quickly. So I can adjust the talk to whatever it is people want to talk about. And if there's something that you don't understand, you're probably not the only person in the room who doesn't understand it. And so I'm, I'm happy to uh, take the talk in any direction that you guys, you guys want to go. Um, so this is the story of the design of the Polyvent Educational Platform. 
Uh, it's made by Public Invention, uh, which is a US 501c3. Our motto is invent in the public for the public. Um, Nathaniel here uh, started Polyvent actually when he was 15. Um, he's the lead engineer. Um, there's another person, uh, Dr. Victor Sutrin, who is a physiologist who co-created Polyvent, who's not here today, he's in Germany. Uh, he runs a startup making surgical instruments, but he has kindly donated most of his time. Almost everyone working for this is a volunteer uh, to produce this. And then I graduated from Rice at Hanson 87 uh, and am a computer scientist and started public convention. So I'd like to remind everybody something that's easy to forget. In the spring of 2020, we had um, refrigerated trucks used as morgues because of the number of people that were dying in the United States because of the pandemic, okay? And uh, at one point, 3,000 people a day were dying, which is the number of people who were killed in 1911. Um, there was, at the beginning, a legitimate fear that there would be one million deaths in America due to a lack of ventilators. This was experience based on Northern Italy. Now, in hindsight, some people have called this the ventilator panic, but that's not really true. This was a legitimate fear based on the knowledge that we knew that we had at the time about the disease, okay? That knowledge evolved, and I'm gonna talk about that. Um, so at that time, you may recall there were shutdowns across America, not as many as in other places. The New York Times had headlines about the ventilator shortage. Over 100 teams, including Rice University, um, were instantly created to try to solve this problem. Okay, now this is not a good problem to try to solve quickly. To build medical devices, highly sophisticated medical devices, does not fit an emergency situation. Nonetheless, People swung into action, is that the correct verb? Um, and uh, tried to build this. So I know this because with the help of some volunteers, I built a spreadsheet that evaluated all of the open source ventilators. And you'll notice that the Rice um, OEDK design, the Apollo BVM is on this, this spreadsheet. Um, and the Polyvent team started at, this, at the same time. Okay, at this time, Ford and GM um, dedicated production lines and made 80,000 emergency ventilators. Those were paid for by the U.S. government, okay? So this was not a um, panic. It was more or less a mistake, okay? Because we didn't know at that time of the happy hypoxia um, uh, um, syndrome that occurs with COVID-19, particularly with the early variants that, that were in place there. So it turned out the wealthy nations never really had a shortage of ventilators. And I can talk about the physiology of that if you're interested in, in why it is the case. Okay, um, and about the time it was, we were figuring out that there weren't going to be a shortage of ventilators and our you know grandparents were gonna be dying because they didn't have ventilators here, um, Polyvent, join public invention. Okay, so um, I'd like to briefly talk about this timeline and then hand it over to Nathaniel to talk about what he was doing with Polyvent. So you may recall in June of 2020, there was significant uncertainty about what was gonna happen, okay? Um, most of the ventilator teams though started to lose steam because it was clear that there wasn't gonna be life-threatening shortages of ventil ventilators. Okay, the US FDA provided emergency use authorization for ventilators early in this period, but they stopped that in about October. Okay, by November, there had been 200,000 cases uh, of deaths in the United States with up to 3,000 a day. And very quickly, vaccination began. So the, vac the vaccine was developed very quickly. At this point, PPE was still in such short supply due to the fragility of the global supply chain that it was being reused. So doctors were using the same mask for a week. Okay. Um, and why don't you explain what you were doing in 2020? So we started the project, the Polyvent project, although it wasn't called that in the beginning, about two or three weeks into the pandemic. And that's where I met uh, Victor and other people who were working on the project. Um, so we started in, I believe it was a hackathon 
run by McGill University in Montreal. And I got together with a friend from Ontario that, I, well, I didn't know him at the time. I'm good friends with him now. We came together, we built the first prototype, then we went over back to Ontario, built the second prototype, and kept uh, working on that. So at the time, I think we were both under 18. He was 17 and I was 15, and it was, that was honestly a great time. We were working on all kinds of stuff, and we were working maybe 18 hours a day. We were going very hard because we, well, we were seeing all these, this news coming out in New York and all over the world about that, and um, yeah, I think this is something that if you're an engineering student, any of you could participate in something like this. So this is one of those places where you can really do something, even with little experience and little uh, you know, work knowledge and without a huge network of contacts, you can get into this hackathon you can find the right people and you can get together and uh, build something great. So that's, um, that, that's really the early story of it. And then after that hackathon ended, it was, it was a bit of a disaster in the end, but I won't get into that. We went into the um, EU versus virus and Polyvent, I believe, won that or they placed in the EU versus virus medical devices top three list. And we then went to Austria to put together another prototype for about, I think that, that was two weeks, and we, that was the first time we actually encountered Rob Zventmon. So he had sent in the earlier version of this thing, which is an open source spirometer, for us to work on that. And I remember, I think, Half an hour before our talk, or maybe an hour before, we were, he was coding the Wi-Fi passwords to try and get this thing to work in the, the Wi-Fi in the Austrian makerspace that we were in. Um, so that's, we didn't really know Rob at the time, except I think Victor knew you. And after that, it sort of, it progressed from there. We started working more with Public Invention. We joined them. And from there, the project's grown. And all the stuff that you see here is, things that we've designed and built over the past year and a half or so. Do you have a question, Savi? Oh, yes. Yeah. So this is the one that I loaned Rice University uh, uh, for the, one of the inhalation projects. Um, it actually doesn't work because the Rice students broke it. But, um, <laughs> the, so a spirometer means measurement of the breath. Okay, and it's, they're often used by athletes and trumpet players. In this case, that was designed very specifically, um, mostly by a, a woman named Loria Clark and a gentleman named Ben Coombs, uh, who are not here, to um, uh, uh, measure source. ventilators. So in, when, while Nathaniel was doing this, and I didn't know him, Public Invention was building that device, because I had built this spreadsheet of all of these ventilators, and I was like, I'm not going to build a ventilator. There's too many people building ventilators. But people weren't focused on testing. So this is a test device. And one of the things that, are, that is critically important for any engineer to understand is that testing, depending on what you're doing, is 50 to 80% of your work. Mm -hmm. So there, it's just absolutely critical. It's almost like engineering is the same as testing. It's being clever in how you're testing. So that device technically measures flow, pressure, humidity, temperature, and FiO2 fraction. Mm -hmm. And those things are not particularly interesting if you're, for example, a trumpet player. You don't care about all that. But for a ventilator, it's very important, in particular because of um, the need for oxygen. So. Therapeutic oxygen is a miracle drug for people who have had strokes, heart attacks, or are experiencing pneumonia. Mm -hmm. And sadly, although it took a long time to get there, in January of 2021, there was a terrible crisis in India caused by COVID-19 of a lack of therapeutic oxygen. The official death toll, I think, is 350,000. Most people believe that's an underestimate by a factor of three to five of the number of people who died. Some people have suggested maybe 5 million people died during this period of time. So many people died that they couldn't 
find wood for their normal funerary practices. Okay, now, Public Invention also built an oxygen concentrator, that, and that project has now been canceled. This is not an oxygen concentrator, and that's a different kind of technology. But normally, a ventilator provides a mixture of oxygen and a mixture of air, and this one does too. There's yep. a mixing chamber right here we'll talk about. Why am I telling you this? Because what the situation in India showed was that our global supply chains are fragile and people die because we don't have enough medical supplies. In the United States, probably the lack of, of PPE killed people due to trans, greater infection than we might have had if everybody had had proper PPE. In, in other situations around the world in low and middle income countries, they're, they're missing more basic care. Okay, now in hindsight, Providing oxygen to the world is more important than ventilators, for reasons I'll explain. But we just happen to start on ventilators. Um, as you guys know, in America, we don't normally have tsunamis, but there can be earthquakes, volcanic eruptions, forest fires, and of course, wars also create this uh, problem. One thing that public in invention is doing is um, we're supporting an open source tourniquet to be built for the people of Ukraine as a separate operation. All right, so um, let, me, let me pause now before I go into basic physiology and see if there are any questions. And there, if you're listening on Zoom, I don't know how many people are listening, you're welcome to send a question in through chat and we'll, we'll try to answer it. Okay, so hopefully that means this is so fascinating that no one wants to interrupt it with a question. But seriously, if you have a question, I'm more than happy to, to talk about. So basic physiology of breathing is you need oxygen in, but just as importantly, you have to get carbon dioxide out, okay? And that's what happens. So you, you can use more highfalutin medical terms for this, but when you have COVID-19, some people will develop ARDS, approximately one half of 1%, and your lungs fill up with lung snot, and it lowers your blood oxygen to the point that a weakened person may lose the ability to breathe on their own, okay? Now, um, it is the case that with COVID-19, you can survive a lower blood oxygen level than you could if the same blood oxygen level were caused for some other reason. And that's not even well understood today. Um, so that was one reason more people were ventilated than perhaps should have been at the beginning of the pandemic because they were using the standard of care that applied for smoke inhalation or pneumonia or emphysema or some other disease, even though it may not have been appropriate. But the basic way a ventilator works, and we're going to turn this on in a minute, is it blows air into your lungs. Human lungs basically exhale on their own. So all of us, we have the ability to consciously exhale like this, <gasps> but we don't normally. Normally we inhale and our lungs are like kind of balloons and they just kind of naturally flow out, okay? So there are other ways to do it, but basically you blow, rhythmically blow air and a mixture, if you're sick, of air and oxygen, enriched air into the lungs of a patient. Simple. It's literally, you just do that. But it's not easy. Because if you do it too hard or too fast or not enough, you will kill the patient. In particular, if you do it too hard, you can rupture the lungs or create damage which is invisible but will cause a problem called barotrauma. So you have to do it precisely. So it's simple, but simple doesn't mean easy. Okay? Now, a ventilator like this can be used for invasive and non-invasive ventilation, and, it, and it, the distinction is a little subtle. Um, I hope none of your loved ones ever are invasively ventilated. If you were invasively ventilated due to COVID-19, your chance of survival was 50%. Okay, um, and there's more that could be said about that. But before you get so sick, you have to be invasively ventilated, where they give you drugs to make you unconscious put a tube down your throat, and then take over your breathing, you can have breathing support with enriched oxygen and assistance in breathing from a device like this, okay? And that may be, in the end, the way these open source devices are used more than uh, for something else. 
So we could talk more about physiology, but we don't have time unless people have questions about it. It's not as simple as I'm describing, but you can simulate it with a plastic test loan right here, which we're going to show in just a minute. Um, okay, so it's important to understand breathing pressures are about one-third of one PSI. Your bicycle tire has 50 to 100 PSI. Breathing pressures are incredibly low compared to other pressures that we're dealing with. Okay, um, if for some reason the ventilator fails, you've got five minutes before the patient dies, right? Mm -hmm. Because if you're invasively ventilated, this is not true if you're non-invasively ventilated, the complete oxygen demand is supplied by the machine. If it stops, the patient's gonna die or have brain death in five minutes, okay? And by the way, Public Invention is making a separate device called the General Purpose Alarm Device, which we have right here, which is a prototype, for alarming um, medical conditions. The, yeah, the ventilators we've well, made so like far don't do that yet, but we're building that in. Okay, um, so now I'd like to ask Nathaniel to talk about the project um, between 2021 and 2022, unless we have some questions about ventilation or physiology that we want to talk about here. Okay. So uh, I already explained a little bit of the context from 2020. You can use this little oh. laser. If you push the green button, it shoots a laser. Gun. Got it. So we started by working on bellows, pumps, ventilators, and we were doing that for a very long time. So we had these machines with a large motor that would compress and decompress a pump. You see these in some of the older machines, in the machines from the 70s and 80s. Um, since then, we have based our design on the Smith vent design. And yep, so that was what the ventilator looked like about a year and a half ago, yeah. I think. Middle of 2021. And so we've we were able to pivot so fast from building ventilators that were based on bellows to ventilators that were based on, this is a, a proportional valve, I'll, I'll explain it more later, because we built, and this is part of our project's greater vision, we build very modular systems, and the core of that would be the electronics. So this is a polyvent control module, the second version of one. And it has cards in it for, here, I'm going to take the cards I'll out hold here. Those, I'll hold those up while you're talking. There you go. So that, uh, what Rob is holding, is a card that controls valves in the machine. So that card can turn the valves on and off. I believe that's a backplane connector, and the large one is a backplane connector, and the other one is a control board. So... Any of you who do electrical engineering, this is an ESP32 microcontroller. We've got some SAMD21 ones in, uh, that Sabia is going to pass around. Oh, maybe we should pass the G-pad, too? That's a G-pad. No, um, yeah, okay. So this is the general purpose alarm device. It's got a, a bigger display and some very bright LEDs and it has a little buzzer on it for alerting when something goes wrong, like if the ventilator fails. Yep. So what's also nice about these is that I can take the cards out of this machine, like so. Well, it's, it's plugged in, so I'm not going to do it exactly like that. But I can take them out, and this is pretty much the same card as you're seeing over there. Just I think there are two wire connections different in this one. And it can just be plugged into here. And it can all just start working all at once together, which means that um, engineers and researchers working on machines like this can expand the capabilities of it simply by plugging in new cards that they've designed into here. And we have documented how you would go about producing your own cards, what 
kind of connectors you need, what standards you need to follow, the size of the card, and all that. Um, at least to me, since this is the, the part that I spent the most time working on, this is the most exciting part of the Polyvent project. It's the ability to swap out all this stuff to be able to change things pretty much overnight because of these things that come together like Legos. Um, for example, the G-pad, uh, which there's a board right over there, this is connected, this can be connected to the control module. And we have another team from SPEC, uh, which is a group that we work with that um, is going to build an adapter card for this. So even though we've already designed our electronics, we're able to swap out parts and add functionality, which I, as far as I know, no other ventilator can do. Right. Uh, medical ones definitely can't, and they can't and be used in... And you might ask, what kind of functionality do you need to add to a ventilator? Well, you can have heaters, humidifiers, nebulizers, d alarm devices, drug delivery systems, um, percussive in ventilation, acoustic ventilation, other kinds of things that, that can all be done with sort of the same system in a modifiable way. Yeah. Go ahead, sorry. This uh, opens up a lot of doors for research and education since, well, a student doing, uh, do you do capstone projects here? Yeah, so a student doing their capstone project could design, for example, a card that goes in an existing polyvent machine and find, create a new mode of ventilation or create something new and it'll fit within the system and work great all together like that. So yeah, I, I think that's one of our project's biggest edges on uh, everything Okay, else. so, so uh, why don't you explain why we switched from bellows to the mixing chamber? So um, we were working with bellows for a long time and these had all sorts of problems, uh, some with were with ceiling, some were with, uh, do you have them? Yep. All right. So if we go back to, am I going forwards? Up, oh, back. So these had huge problems with ceiling on the top and bottom. So I don't know if you can really see there, but, well, you can't see it, but there's a second bellow on the inside because you have that turning screw that goes straight through the middle of this. So there's a bell on the inside, a bell on the outside, and there's a sort of donut-shaped thing inside it, which is so what you, the air... So you use a stepper motor to squish it, and that provides the pressure of the air. Yeah. So those caused some issues, and we moved on to simpler design. Oh, am I going the wrong way? Yep. All right. And this was our next one. So we removed the donut shape. It's gotten larger. And these worked okay for about 12 hours. <laughs> so uh, we didn't want to use lubricants on that screw there. And there were alignment problems on those top and bottom plates, which made it so that the brass nut that made this actually move up and down, the most important part in it, would get worn down extremely fast and produce this brass powder that would go everywhere. So there are some solutions to these, but not something that was medically very acceptable. So we put that on hold. We may come back to it one day if there's a need for it, but it's going to have to be a very different design than that bellows stage that you see there. One thing I'd like to point out is we switched to a proportional valve system, um, which was sort of pioneered by um, Smith College. If you guys don't know, I didn't know. Smith is sort of the premier women's college in the, the United States. And they had built an award-winning proportional valve-based um, mm -hmm. uh, uh, ventilator. So the idea of a proportional valve is that, uh oh, I'm going the wrong way, no wonder. Um, uh, you have a higher pressure and you use a very controlled valve to release pressure into the, cha the breathing chamber. Mm -hmm. Okay, and they kind of quit working on theirs. I don't, I'm not really sure why. They did a great job and then they quit working on it. Um, and so we uh, came back. Oh, 
There you go. Yeah. So we switched to the Smith Vent style design around October 2020. Yeah. Uh, 2021, I mean. So since then, we've been refining that. I think there are three prototypes. The first wasn't that good. This is the second. Um, and this is the third. And um, when you guys get a closer look at this later, you'll see that these two are essentially the same thing. All the parts are about the same, except it's in a different package. The wiring is different. And some things, like the, uh, the damping for the valves and the electricals, have changed somewhat. But if you look at the airflow, it's all the air, the, where the valves are positioned and what each valve does is about the same as the, Rice, uh, the sorry, Smith College design that we based it on. OK, so let's, let's speed this up here. Yep. Um, so why don't you just talk about the educational design and then what's happening today? So we've gone more into producing educational ventilators. So these are prototypes for something that hopefully we will be able to use and show in universities and that students can work on them, modify them, improve them, and people can, we can really build a whole open source community centered around universities. Uh, this would help us get into the, this would help our open source design get closer to being certified by the FDA. This is a very far off goal, but that is maybe our 20 year plan. So. Stud undergrad students and graduate students work with these, develop new technologies with them, because normal ventilators cannot be hacked into to try new things. So these become a good platform to do that. Then we can get into veterinary work and provide uh, cheaper and open machines to ventilate pigs and rats and animal research studies, which brings down the cost. And finally, um, a company, which is not going to be us, will make these ventilators, say, for example, in India. They may come, take our design, bring it through their certification process, and then commercialize it and sell it. And this will lower the cost and the barrier to entry, since we have put in thousands of dollars of engineering work into it already. So the risk is lower for the investors in that company. The risk is lower for the people who want to bring it to market. And this turns into cost savings and ultimately more people in the world who can afford ventilators. And it's going to be evaluated this afternoon for the first time by st actual students. And we don't know what's going to happen. But we've designed a little classroom education module. Uh, OK. So there are a lot of details uh, here about it, uh, and there are open research questions. Um, producing gas flow is it's debatable what the best way to do this is. Rice developed what's called a bag squeezer, the Rice Apollo BVM. Some doctors, like Dr. Eric Schultz, think those are a bad idea. Turbines work, but they're hard to start fast enough because they have a lot of inertia. You have to use carbon fiber blades. Pistons tend to leak. Bellows are easy to make, but they're problematic because they tend to wear out. Can carefully control proportional valves have some advantages. That's what we're trying to do. Um, and testing is extremely important. So um, we had the Ventmons. And why don't we do a demo now? Unless right. there are any questions for Nathaniel about the first part of this. Yep. OK. So just got to plug it in. Uh, oh. yeah, you plug that in. You got to put it in the air. I think you could uh, reset vent OS, though. Do what? Oh, okay. there we go. Well, it's fine. OK. So we have here a testic, uh, um, pl sorry, a plastic test lung um, that is made by software that was made by myself and another organization called Helpful Engineering. This is the vent display software that, that you're, you're seeing here. OK. And this is the actual, OK, that pressure's low. Uh, let's see. I think we're at 20 for the tank pressure. Okay. 
weird. Yeah. There we go. Okay, so what you're seeing is a, a research and a clinical display. When a real human being is on a ventilator, doctors look at this display, and they can tell a lot about the condition of the lung. They can tell what kind of disease you have from the shape of this curve, okay? And I, I'm oversimplifying because we have to shorten it here, but basically they try to keep you alive with the lowest pressure that keeps you oxygenated. And if you get really sick, they increase the pressure, but they don't want to do that because it could create, it could harm your lungs. But if you're not, if you don't have enough oxygen and gas exchange, they have to do it. So they, they, they tune things here. Okay. Now, um, a future goal of this project is to integrate this display, which right now, and in, by the way, any of you can go to this. This is live on the internet. Okay. It, it, this is connected via Wi-Fi to your internal Wi-Fi and is publishing this data on a public data lake, okay? And that was very useful during the um, pandemic because engineering teams couldn't even meet in person. So they, one engineer could be working on a ventilator and another one could say, oh, the curve looks good or, oh, the rise time's not very good or, 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 or so forth. Now, the Ventmon device was given to a, it, we made 30 of them. A lot of them just sat on shelves, I'm afraid. We gave 30 away, but six teams around the world, including one in Germany and lots of different places, used it and really loved it. It was very, very important. Um, you can kind of buy similar equipment to the Ventmon, but it costs $10,000, um, and it doesn't cost so much here. Okay, now, um, the, the, y'all can come down here now if you want. Um, so one thing we don't have uh, is a graphical user interface that would be good for a clinician sort of set up. Um, so this system is controlled via um, the serial port. And so those of you who are Arduino programmers will be used to this. And so it's, it's kind of one of our goals yeah. in so the got, next time. Um, we've almost got this working. And now I'm gonna change the... Okay. Gonna turn the compressor off. Did something happen? All right, I'm gonna change the, that should have changed the respiration rate. So you should see up here, and also you ah. can be able to see that I've slowed down the respiration rate. And while Nathaniel's talking, I'm gonna increase the uh, pressure just slightly. Yep, so Rob's able to control all that through his computer. And if you look at the main, so I'm gonna go through all the parts of the machine. So on the, Right here, we've got the input ports, so an air and an oxygen valve can mix, air, can mix air and oxygen into this tank here. And this tank is currently at a pressure, probably around 30 PSI, where it'll all just, it mixes together very well on its own. Then that air, that air-oxygen mixer, comes out through this tube here goes through and goes to our proportional valve. This is really the core of the ventilator, this uh, metal colored valve right here. That is controlled through a PID loop to make sure that it keeps the pressure as flat as possible. And this is a pretty big programming challenge, but this is one of the big things that VentOS does. So, so let, me, let me interrupt. I've lowered the pressure to 10 centimeters of water, which would be a little light. Can I have a volunteer? Just put your hand on the test lung and hold it down a little bit, and you'll see how the PID loop adjusts to it. Go ahead. Put a little pressure on it. And we'll be able to see in the waveform. It takes, this, is, this lags that by about five seconds because of the internet and all that kind of stuff. We should be able to see um, a change in yeah, less volume doing. has gone through because we're aiming for that pressure, right? So if you hold it down even harder, or if you, if you let go or wiggle your hand, you can see that what we're doing is we're recording it here. And you, you might think, well, that's a wacky thing to do. But it isn't because the human being does that. The human being coughs, or they may have some liquid process in their lungs that happens, they, they bring up something. Mm -hmm. um, so things like that happen all the time, and the, the system has to adjust for it, okay? Now, 
Um, on this is running software, which was mostly written by me. Mm -hmm. So, and one of the things is that software, the VentOS software, is designed to run on any ventilation platform that uses the Arduino-based system. Okay, mm -hmm. so one of our secret weapons here is we were able to, we're, we're able to change the hardware because we have a very um, generic uh, software platform mm -hmm. behind it. If high pressure manages to somehow get through this, there should be an overpressure valve here. Now, weirdly, these are insanely hard to source. I was looking for a few hours and I couldn't find one of these. So this is the kind of valve you could produce, like in the ODEC. You just need a little gasket. But, but that would normally that be built need... into a breathing circuit. So the doctors have those things in place already. Oh. The breathing circuit being this hose that goes out, that goes to the actual patient. So in real life, of course, you wouldn't have a vent mount, and, and this thing would stick in a mask or down the throat of a human being. Mm -hmm. Why use customizable hardware rather than software? Rather than software. What, what does the plug and play with your hardware chips enable you to do that right. software modifications wouldn't? So with hardware modifications, you could change the pressure sensors. You could change whether you're running a proportional valve or a motor, which no matter how much you code, you're not going to be able to want to do to be able to do that. Um, and this will allow you to well, you can swap out any mechanical part in the machine. So. But of course, there's another dimension to your question, right? I mean, we are using off-the-shelf hardware. We're just recombining it in different ways. I mean, the ESP32 is an incredibly popular microcontroller. There's nothing exotic about it. The most exotic thing that we're using is the $500 proportional valve. That's yeah. the most expensive part here. Okay, so a ventilator that has these features would start at $20,000, and it, the parts in this probably cost $1,500 to make, yeah. including and It can be brought down if we do yeah, a larger would, run. Right, but just roughly speaking. So we, it, it, it's, it's a little weird. Science is about truth, but engineering is about compromise. So this is a compromise between using custom PCBs, off-the-shelf parts, and custom software. Mm -hmm. Okay. The other answer to your question is there is no other way to do it. I mean, you can't buy, I mean, you, you can't buy a ventilator because even if you bought a ventilator for $20,000 that had all these parts in it, they wouldn't let you open the case. And you can't change the software. And they wouldn't let you, you know, you, you, a researcher couldn't change it, or at least it would void the warranty if, if they tried to change it. And the, the companies won't give you the software and let you change it. Okay. So all of that is in place. Abby asks, do you know why uh, many of the examples you sent out were unused and, quote, sat on the shelves? Uh, were you able to investigate why they were unused? Uh... Well, because first of all, people are like that. If you give away something for free, they'll take one and not use it. But secondly, this was, the, this was made during a period of time when many of the ventilator teams had started with great urgency and were stopping. Yeah, some lasted maybe three weeks, two weeks. Teams got together, worked insanely hard, stopped. It, ha it started and stopped very fast. Yeah. Um, in hindsight, giving them away for free might not have been the best strategy. We, maybe we should have made people pay a thousand bucks to be, have skin in the game. But we were given grants to give them away for free, so, so we did. I'm gonna, so I'm going to go through this real fast, and um, anyone who wants can talk to me uh, later. Let's see. Is that going forward? Okay. So this is a schematic of every ventilator in the world. All right. Every ventilator has these abstract modules in it, and we utilize that both in terms of hardware and software uh, to, to build the system that, that we want here. Oh, I, I'm going the wrong way. So I'm going to have to go very quickly. So um, we've talked a lot about hardware modularity. There's also software modularity. We've talked about that. We've talked about the stuff that he did. Um, I know enough about FDA regulatory stuff. I don't want people to think I'm ignorant of that. Um, we know how to do it. Uh, basically, 
our, our design is such that we want someone to take this design and then begin the regulatory process for that. We're not planning to do that ourselves. Um, originally, we used a quality management thing because we tried to do that. We were actually doing that too early. So researchers don't really have to worry about this. And um, a gentleman who works with Rice, Larry Kilizuski, makes a, a clear distinction between design for manufacture and design for prototyping. And what's done in a university and what we're doing is design for prototype or design for research. We're, this is not designed to be mass produced yet. But when you mm -hmm. are going to mass produce something, you're obviously marketing it for medical purposes. You have to have FDA regulation. We didn't necessarily know that uh, originally. So here's an old solenoid valve. We chose a solenoid valve that was wrong. These things are hard to source, and we just made a mistake, and we moved to a better one later. Um, sometimes we built things out of PLA and they cracked. Um, now I'd like to talk about design learning. These, some of these are my own opinion and you guys could disagree. Okay, Buckminster Fuller called this the processional principle, which is a little weird, but I've found it to be true. Basically, whenever you research something, or let's say you're an undergraduate and you work on a project, you probably are not going to get what you think you mm -hmm. are going to get out of it. But That's you often get something here. more valuable. Okay, and that has happened to, to us. We wanted to save lives. We didn't save any lives. We, we haven't built a medical device. But we've done something else which may end up being equally valuable. And research is just generally like that in my experience. So Isaac Asimov said, the most exciting phrase to hear in science, the one that heralds new discoveries is not Eureka, I found it, but that's funny. It's, it's when something weird happens and you discover uh, an opportunity that you should track this, this down. Now, I am not a, a great scientist, but this has happened once in my life recently, and I got a really good paper out of it. Something funny that I couldn't explain happened actually in a mathathon, and we, we did some stuff. So it's true. Um, so, for example, Public Convention now contracts with NASA to advise them on electronic control of ceramic oxygen generator. Um, Aliform, the company in Germany that makes a medical device, might not have gotten their investment funding if they hadn't worked on this project. And the team, uh, and there are a number of engineers we haven't mentioned who helped Nathaniel with this, um, uh, has now extensive knowledge and is ready to do the next projects. So this is the most important thing that I can suggest to anyone. You go fast by taking baby steps as fast as you can. You don't take giant leaps. You do everything small and iteratively, and you build on whatever you're doing. And the more modular you can make it, the faster you go. So Isaac Newton said, if I have seen further than others, it's because of standing on the shoulder of giants. OK, he lived a long time ago when people kept research secret, and there was an emphasis on proving how smart you are. That is now an outdated concept. The age of the heroic inventor and the genius is over. We're now in the age of cooperation. So instead of standing on the shoulders of giants, you're going to be standing on the shoulders of your friends. Okay? And what your job, particularly as an undergraduate, and this is a real problem. You see, this took two and a half years to do. Undergraduates tend to have to think in terms of semesters and years. It's just the nature of the, the work you do. It's really hard to finish anything significant in a semester or even a year, okay? So what you do is you think of yourself as I'm making a brick that is gonna be part of an edifice that someone else is building on, okay? And so you are gonna be one of these people maybe at the bottom, okay? Maybe you'll be at the top standing on other people. And if I could say anything to you, it's go iteratively and try to build, do whatever you do, do it so other people can take over when you're done with it. And in the end, that's the way you will be recognized, because you will be recognized for that work because it will be successful. Um, so you really want to do that. Um, persistence overcomes stupidity. Don't, don't be afraid of making mistakes. Just try to make your mistakes fast. What you want to do is fail early and often. Fail quickly, learn from your mistakes, and move on. Um, now, just briefly, can you talk about the use of modern technology and how it's changed prototyping? So all of these I was able to build on all the parts here were manufactured by me except for these, the uh, cases which I ordered. 
And that's mostly due to new, super cheap technologies that anyone can afford. So on a student's salary, I was 16, 17, and I could afford the 3D printers, the CNC machine, and all this stuff that could come together. And um, I'm assuming since you're all undergrads, you're probably as broke as I am. But um, nevertheless, you're able to get at least 3D printers and, well, and order cheaper cheap than laptops PCBs and, and single board computers. Exactly. OK. okay. Um, one thing I want to talk about is that packaging can be ignored for about six hours. OK, I always prototype on a breadboard. By packaging, I don't mean cosmetics. I mean whatever structure is necessary for holding your system. That's different in a biological wet lab than it is in electronics, but it's the, the same principle applies. You don't need to think of it first, but it doesn't take very long. OK, and so here from left going around in a circle, uh, sort of this, that's a CAD drawing. This is a real photograph. Um, so we had this, this beautiful case uh, that um, got smashed in shipping. That got cracked in shipping. is made of acrylic. It fits over this. So this is called what we call the cake dome. So when we pivoted to making an educational ventilator, we literally wanted you to be able to see all of the parts inside it. Mm -hmm. OK, and we're going to remake that out of a tougher, tougher material. Um, and of course, for low and middle income countries, being able to take the case off and service the parts is incredibly valuable. OK, so for example, someone might look at this ventilator and say, wow, it's, it's like three times bigger than it needs to be. We could pack all those things in very tightly. Mm -hmm. You could. And then it would be very hard to service it with a screwdriver. Right, so we, we believe our physical design is, is pretty good. I'm sorry, we're out of time. Oh. OK, um, I believe everyone should aim for publication. If you, if you can't do peer-reviewed publication, just publish it at GitHub. Um, these are ventilation modes that you can be researched. We're building external modules like these. We talked about those. Um, Saving life is uh, what we, the goal is. Um, so what we believe we've done is we built the most modular, most open ventilator that is available. So you have the right to build this right now. Anyone can build it yep. if they want. All of the designs, the physical designs, the software, everything is completely, completely available. Will we continue Polyvent? It depends on how much the students like it this afternoon. Um, you know, it's, it's not obvious to me that it, it's worth our time to continue working on this. We're going we're gonna to publish a paper about it, and then maybe not. So I really don't know. I'm going to try to let the universe tell me if this is what is needed. And it depends on what other people say. And, and I know in your capstone projects and your design projects, you, there's an emphasis on user testing and trying to get feedback and make a decision on the basis of that. Thank you.